and welcome to Hungry Beast. Tonight, we're in lockdown, interrogating the notion of captivity from the greatest Australian prison escapes to a truly incredible woman locked inside her own body. You just can't get any closer to the edge than a doctor saying to you, Marie, do you want to live? Blink once for yes and twice for no. We also meet the warden of the largest captive nation on earth and take a swim on the wild side with one of nature's horniest creatures. But first... From the Captivity News Desk, one of the latest containment weapons in the US Armoury is a fence. A truck-mounted protection system called RAID, it spits out a 330-metre barrier in less than a minute. Billions of dollars of research and they've come up with the world's biggest accordion. And in containment of a different sort, it was recently discovered that during the reign of Saddam Hussein, fish at the Baghdad Zoo had the Iraqi flag permanently lasered onto their scales. Unfortunately, most of them were goldfish, so they can't remember which country the flag belongs to. Captivity isn't limited to people and animals. You can keep an idea, a song or a movie captive. How? Let Mark Fennell liberate your mind. Copyright. Copyright is just a form of creative captivity. I mean, think about it. You've got a bunch of laws designed to lock up somebody's work so that you can't use it. Now, that actually seems like an entirely reasonable idea, except the reality is that we now live in a remix culture. The net has given us a downfall parody for every news event, a sad Keanu meme for every bored lunch. It's just one of the joys of being alive now that we get to mess with pop culture, and almost all of it is breaking copyright laws. But what you send to your friends and post on YouTube is nothing compared to some of the bizarre and inventive ways that people violate copyright all around the world. For starters, Earth's largest film industry, Bollywood, home of some of the most unusual movie rip-offs. Take Shiroya, a reinterpretation of A Few Good Men. You can't can't the the level. Level. Or Kiante, an almost shot-for-shot shot retake of Reservoir Dogs. Both good, but the Indian Superman in Daria Dil definitely takes the cake. In Nigeria, the second largest film industry in the world, Nollywood has taken it one step further. This $250 million industry churns out over 200 videos every month, and now they're remaking American films with African actors, wait for it, in the hope of selling them back to the African-American market. But none of these cross-cultural remakes are anything compared to Turkey. You simply have not lived until you've seen Turkish E.T., who looks like a paper mache octopus with a fire extinguisher painfully lodged in his anus. <laughs> or there's the Turkish Exorcist, in which the Turkish Reagan McNeil spews out chickpea vomit whenever the Turkish Satan compels her. <laughs> Of course, you can't talk about copyright violations without talking about music. And for sheer ingenuity, it is hard to go past American biomedical engineer turned DJ, Girl Talk, who samples tiny fragments from hundreds of pop songs, weaving them together into intricate mega mixes. And then there's China, where copyright violation appears to be a national pastime. I mean, do you start with the fake Disneyland that was made without authorization, or just the umpteen McDonald's and Nike ripoffs? For my money, the winner is the amazing industry of fake Chinese Harry Potter novels released every year. Such as Harry Potter and the Filler of Big, in which all of the students magically transform into wooden stools and Harry shacks up with a belly dancer. Or Harry Potter and the Leopard Walk Up to Dragon. In this one, the author just took the text of Tolkien's The Hobbit and replaced all the character names with names from the Harry Potter universe. Except for Gandalf. Whether you agree with remixing or not is almost irrelevant. So much creativity is built on violating copyright, on reusing, reinterpreting and recombining bits of pop culture. The real question is, why would you want to lock up these works? Movie studios, record labels, lobby groups, they all spend millions of dollars on lawsuits and online spam and mildly insulting ad campaigns to convince us that copyright is something to be respected. But let's be honest, disrespect? Way more fun. Did you hear Copperfield escape? Oh, typical. Uh, I know. Stuff said, captivity. It wasn't me. A tattoo on the chest of Ronnie Venezi, who escaped from Parkley Correctional Centre on the 19th of January, 2011. I'd like to microchip a lot of different people just to be a little bit flippant about it, but I don't think that's going to happen. 
South Australian Police Commissioner Mal Hyde discussing possible future crime prevention measures, 24th January 2011. Can I still live in your apartment? The first question Ingrid Betancourt's estranged husband put to her when she was released after six years being held hostage by Colombian rebels. July 2008. This week we're exploring the theme of captivity. I recently had the pleasure of meeting a pretty awesome lady. 17 years ago, Marie Burke Callis suffered a massive stroke from a knock received during a netball game. She's now what the medicos call locked in, unable to move or speak. Her brain is 100% there, but it's inside a body that can only communicate by blinking. For this interview, I sent Marie a bunch of questions in advance and it took her nearly a week to blink out her answers. You're about to hear Marie's responses being read out by her sister, Bernie. Guys, meet Marie. I would be considered a high achiever. Learning was a passion and still is. A real self-starter. I travelled Australia and loved the outdoors. I was very physically active, competing at high levels in netball and middle distance running. Even though I cannot do all those normal activities you associate with living, such as walking and talking, I have a big reason for getting out of bed in the morning. I have a purpose that is about achieving, doing the impossible and challenging myself to go that little bit further every day. Who helps me? Peter, first and foremost. We met at a ball for race week in Darwin. It was love at first sight, but little did we know what lay ahead. Kylie, could you get me another pillow, please? Sorry. I think it was probably love at first sight. Yeah, we sort of glanced across the room at each other and, and uh, within about five minutes, I think we were talking, conversing and having a drink. <laughs> one, two, one, A, B, C, one. We communicate via a, a universal communication system where we use the vowel system and letters in the alphabet for Marie to acknowledge letters that become words that then become sentences. One, two, E could use, use, U-S-E. One, two, three, E, F, could you see? <laughs> could you see me? <laughs> well, you, you ins insinuating I might have been a bit inebriated. <laughs> <laughs> I suffered the stroke very soon after moving to Wyala to be with Pete. He was my inspiration for survival. Well, Marie had been uh, complaining a couple of days beforehand of some serious headaches and, uh, and wouldn't go to the doctor <laughs> after uh, numerous requests from myself. And um, yeah, she just uh, got up one morning, went and had a shower and came back into the bedroom to get dressed and collapsed. And had this massive stroke. So. Yeah, it was pretty devastating. I thought she'd dropped dead in front of me. I thought she'd died. It was all so weird. Take a moment to put yourself in my position. In the space of only hours, you've gone from finishing breakfast and having a shower at home to laying flat on your back in a hospital bed. You cannot move anything. You cannot talk. And at this early stage, you cannot see. There are tubes up your nose and someone has cut a hole in your throat and inserted another tube so you can breathe. You are terrified because you don't know what's happening to you. You know you are crying, but there is no sound. Everyone around you is so distressed. It was just total shock and devastation. You know, you just think that that happens to old people. Not to your sister, not to your vibrant, active sister or, or daughter. I think Dad found it extremely hard. He would just walk and walk for miles. You know, he just found it hard that he couldn't fix it, as fathers do. You know, and I think, as Mum said, that when you, you're told that you'll never hear your daughter's voice again, that she'll never speak and never move, that it's just, you know, heart-wrenching. 
that's what was so weird. All this was going on outside, but on the inside, I was fully conscious to all that was happening. I could hear every word. I could recognise voices of family. I could hear the doctors talking, a priest giving the last rites. Then it starts to dawn on me. Oh my God, I am locked inside my own body. And at this moment, I have no way of telling anyone that I'm here. Many hours later, amongst the noise, confusion and chaos of that first day, there was a defining moment. Not everything was paralysed. I could blink. You just can't get any closer to the edge than a doctor saying to you, Marie, do you want to live? Blink once for yes and twice for no. I put every ounce of my being into that blink. It was the biggest decision of my life. You could see in her eyes that it was the same Marie, but certainly facially, initially, it was, was hard to look at Marie and say, yeah, this is the Marie I met, you know, yeah. But then you look in her eyes and you see it. What do I love about Peter? He has stood by me and stands for me, no matter how tough things get. We understand each other completely. When there are things that need to be said and done that I cannot physically do, he has been my voice and legs for 17 years. One, two, E, punishing me. You couldn't imagine life without me punishing you daily. Is that right? Yeah. And how do I feel about that? Good. <laughs> Because I have a strong mind, brain, I don't feel trapped as such. There are things I obviously can't do, but I've never let myself get into a mindset of being trapped. It has become less important to have a verbal voice. My look and body language speaks volumes. I instruct staff, manage my household, and communicate clearly. I eat through my mouth and drink from a cup. I breathe normally all of which is a reflection of how healthily I keep my body. I also function just like any other woman in every way. I cry, I laugh, I get angry, sad, and I enjoy an active social life. I admire everything about Marie. I, I kind of envy some of the stuff, like I envy her mind and her strong willedness and her ability to get up every day with a smile on her face and just get on with it. Marie has taught me to be patient. <laughs> Is that convincing enough? Yeah, I know, you're smart ass. <laughs> I am so lucky to have had two lives, an abled life and a disabled life. How amazing is that? Yeah, I mean, certainly uh, we're soulmates. You just gotta, gotta do it, you gotta be there to give Marie all the love and support that she needs. It's a pretty big journey she's on. I have come to understand that your body is just the vehicle that carries your brain around. And as long as that is functioning, then you'll never be trapped. Supreme leader of North Korea, the world's most captive nation. A slave state where famine is the norm, 
49 million people are trapped in their homes every night without electricity. An old school dictator, the reclusive Kim, mixes repression with myth making and delusions of grandeur. North Korean children are taught that his birth was heralded by a spontaneous double rainbow, a new star, and a giant talking iceberg. Apparently, many also believe he controls the weather, but that is not Kim's only magic. According to state textbooks, Kim does not produce urine or faeces. His official biography insists that Kim Jong-il is the world's greatest golfer, routinely scoring three or four holes in one every time he plays. Kim Jong-il is also prone to dictatorial whim. An ex-teacher claimed that in 1989, Kim cleansed the entire capital, Pyongyang, of short people. He also imprisons family members of convicts, believing the stain of criminality persists for three generations. North Koreans live in poverty, with 68% of the country surviving on food rations and one in three children malnourished. Meanwhile, flight-phobic Kim reportedly airlifts lobsters into his armoured train when he travels. Kim also likes a drink. Hennessy Cognac say that in 1993 and 1994, the dictator was the company's biggest single client. But Kim Jong-il is not impervious to his people's needs. In 2006, he announced a plan to import and breed giant rabbits to feed the poor. He then discovered that they produced less food than they consumed, but Kim still bought 12. When not starving or imprisoning people, Kim loves to create. His biography says that he's composed six operas and stages elaborate musicals. He's also a movie buff, author of On the Art of Cinema. And in 1978, Kim had a South Korean film director, Shin sang Ok, and his actress wife kidnapped. They were held captive for eight years and forced to make propaganda movies, all of which credit Kim as executive producer. Best known is Pulgasari, which is basically Godzilla as capitalism and made out of rice. Kim Jong-il, dictator, mythmaker and jailer. It would all be funny if it wasn't so sad. This is Hungry Beast Captivity. For as long as there have been prisons, there have been escapes. Some spectacular and successful, others flawed and failed. Dan Illick leads the breakout. Ah! Here, in no particular order, are the Hungry Beast top three Australian escapes. Number three, William Buckley. Convict William Buckley worked at a settlement near present-day Geelong and, like the people of present-day Geelong, he felt a desperate need to run away. When he did, Buckley was gone for so long that people assumed he was dead and the phrase Buckley's chance was coined. Turns out Buckley spent 35 years just hanging out with Aboriginal families, learning the language and setting up Contiki tours of the Greater Port Phillip area. Great Australian escapes, number two! Oh, Jesus. <laughs> In 1972, a couple of Fremantle prison inmates who ran the prison radio station convinced their governor they needed a cell at the top of the building so they could track a French weather balloon without interference from the prison equipment. Oh, good luck. I'll be interested to know how it goes. They punched through the ceiling, crawled to the end of the building and then burst through the roof, bringing their secret homemade telephone with them because the best time to make a prank call to the guardhouse is when you're on the roof of a cell block. So suspicious activity has been reserved down by the carpenter shop. Keep an eye on it for a few minutes. And that's exactly what the guard in the tower did. While the inmates threw a ladder, made a telephone cable, uh, nowhere near the carpenter shop, and made the collect call to freedom. <laughs> Finally! The number one the Great Australian Escape! Helicopter pilot Tim Joyce thought he was taking Lucy Dudko on a joyride in 1999, but when she pulled a shotgun and stuck it to his neck, he realised, no, no, I was wrong. This is a very different situation. In fact, the situation was pretty much the plot of Charles Bronson's classic Breakout, which Dudko had hired the week before. So then, the Sydney woman forced the helicopter to land in the middle of Silverwater Prison Oval, where she picked up inmate and former lover John Killick. They flew away and had 45 days on the lam before being caught and being returned back to jail. Don't ah! tease me! Ah! Ah! about here and just on that line. I'm just going to ask you a few questions about you, pretty much. When in your life have you felt trapped? Last week. <laughs> Maybe now, actually. I 
feel like I'm in a bit of a rut. I thought, you know, I'm on this merry-go-round of catching the three trains to get to work and three trains back. I've been in the same job for like over two years. I sell life insurance over the phone. Uh, I wasn't in war in Croatia, so that would be a big trap. I used to be a pot smoker um, and I was stuck in a group of friends who constantly smoked pot and I just felt in like a rut, I couldn't get out of it. Basically, me and my mum, um, we got uh, captured like in our, in our house. Going to my friend's place, smoking ourselves to oblivion, like it's just starting to affect my brain. Like They had to kind of kill me and my mum, saying they, they did come one day um, to do that and we just escaped from the bullets. In lifts, time slows down and it can just be intensely boring in a lift. Uh, because I was married. <laughs> That's why I was trappy. <laughs> guess when you go out with someone for a long time and you don't know where it's going to go. It's, it's hard to, to just walk away, especially when you've got kids and, and commitments and, and so forth. Hmm, hate to see. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> with my son, he's going through a breakup. There was no one there to help me. Um, and I couldn't do anything about it. He's up north, we're down south. And I felt even worse for my mum because she didn't know what to do either. You feel you haven't got control of your own self and what's going on? I fell in hospital and I had a nervous breakdown. I couldn't feel my legs, I couldn't walk for about two weeks. There's a lot of unknown, like I don't know what I can do and what I can't do and I just, just feel trapped at home all the time. 2007? when I was uh, locked up. At first I didn't want it to go out and all that because like, you know, you know like you don't want to burden your friend, you don't want to burden your family. It's like a cage, you know, you can't do nothing. You, you, you can't go out whenever you want. You can't see your family whenever you want. I feel like um, I'm in prison of my own body, basically, yeah. Thanks so much for stopping by. It was really no worries, lovely mate. chatting to you. You know what kills me about this place? It's a dry heat. Animal rights groups have long maintained that captivity is no place for fish or fowl. But now we have a new and compelling reason as to why we shouldn't lock up some creatures. Dolphins. Intelligent. Friendly. Playful. But in captivity, sometimes they get a little too playful. <laughs> Dolphins are highly sexual creatures. They're one of the few animals that actually have sex for fun. They engage in long acts of foreplay and they even take gay partners. But when you keep these sexually liberated creatures in tanks, stopping them from mating naturally, this can lead to confusion. Sexual confusion. <laughs> Dolphins can become very sexually attracted to perhaps certain people. As far as in captivity is concerned, they just see us as another one of them. There'll be a lot of rubbing, a lot of poking, a lot of prodding, but it's more a show of dominance and a show of aggression. It's more of a game for them rather than anything else. A former Marine Park employee told Hungry Beast, anyone that works with dolphins has to undergo training to spot when the animals get excited. A horny dolphin can get aggressive, and there are numerous cases of swimmers nearly drowning because of dolphins trying to undress them underwater. What's more, an excited dolphin can use its penis to wrap around and grab things, like a human arm or leg. In 1991, a man from the UK was charged with inappropriate sexual conduct with a dolphin after being spotted getting towed away against his will by a dolphin penis. I mean, there's certainly risks. I mean, these animals are tremendously strong and tremendously powerful. So when animals start to become aggressive, a bit pushy, and show that kind of pushy behaviour, you know, you just get out of the pool in a hurry. But the fact that these animals are highly sexual doesn't excuse unscrupulous marine operators who are, in some parts of America, teaching these confused creatures to simulate sex with members of the public as a cheap laugh. Dolphins are rewarded with fish for performing on cue. That is grade A weird family entertainment. So the next time you have the chance to go swimming with captive dolphins, maybe you should think twice. And perhaps we should ask ourselves if interfering with the mating habits of dolphins is really doing either species any favours. Follow the money. 
nine and a half million US dollars, the largest ransom ever received by Somali pirates. $32,000. How much you'd pay for an enslaved Vietnamese woman to have your child through an illegal surrogacy baby ring? $100,375. The average annual cost to keep a prisoner in Australia. No hard feelings. That's it for our captivity episode. You can keep up with us during the week on our website and Facebook and Twitter. Next week on Hungry Beast, more faking it than politics, prostitution and plastic surgery combined. Good night. All around the world, there are cities, towns and villages that are not quite what they seem. Welcome to the Hungry Beast Atlas of Fake. Faked it. Fake it till you make it. Nails. Fake tan. Hair extensions. Yeah, I've got highlights. Fake Louis Vuitton. Right now I've got contact lenses. <laughs> so yeah, my eyes aren't green. And I'm getting a boob job. But yeah, don't show that one. <laughs>